Uh, good evening. It's 8 o'clock in Yerushalayim. This is webyeshiva.org, and it's time to begin our regular halacha shir. Our class this evening and next week is going to focus on kol nidre uh, at the beginning of, uh, of Yom Kippur. And uh, as usual in my shiurim, as usual in all of our classes on the Web Yeshiva, if you have a question, feel free to, uh, to type your question on chat. I will see your question on my screen, and then uh, I can incorporate the answer into the ongoing shiur. Uh, um, uh, let's get the sources on screen so we can begin. Now, um, uh, as we look through the, the the sources which delineate the origin and purpose of Kol Nidre, you're going to get the impression that um, uh, Kol Nidre is, is really, uh, the text is really not so important. Um, on the other hand, uh, the melody is probably very important for for many people, perhaps most people, myself included, uh, the melody might be more powerful than the text itself. Nonetheless, the text does have meaning, and the text does have some importance. And uh, well, let's see what the sources of the text are, and the and the underlying reasons for the texts. I begin. I begin with the the opinions of the Gaonim. After all, uh, Kol Nidre is not actually discussed in the Gemara. If it were discussed in the Gemara, that's what we would begin with. But in the period of the Gaonim, those are the great rabbis of Babylonia after the close of the Talmud. After all, when the Talmud was finally edited and finished, the great yeshivas in Babylonia did not close up, did not close shop and uh, for, for, for centuries uh, until the until the early Middle Ages, the um, the, the great uh, Russia yeshiva, the heads of the yeshivas in Babylonia were the Gaonim and uh, 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 it was in Babylonia that Kol Nidre had its origins. Of course, uh, whenever the Gaonim in that period tell us about uh, a halacha or a practice or a text, it could well be reporting uh, something which had already been common in the Talmudic period, but just didn't happen to be mentioned in the Gemara. In any event, let's see the sources, and they will teach for the, they will speak for themselves. I begin with the Rosh. Uh, the, 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 the Rosh actually lived at the end of the Middle Ages. Rabbeinu Asher, he was originally. Uh, uh, one of the great Baalei Tosafot, and uh, he got a job in got a job in Spain, uh, working as a rab in Spain. So uh, he, he he was the beginning of combining Ashkenaz and Sephardic traditions, and I'm quoting him because uh, he has a fundamental point about Kol Nidre, Holchim Lebet Knesset, talking about Yom Kippur. Uh, you have the final meal, and uh, after the final meal before Yom Kippur, Holchim Lebet Knesset, you go to the synagogue. Nahagua Shachazan Motzi Sefer Torah. The minhag is minhag, as opposed to halachic obligation, uh, the practice of the people, as opposed to the halachic mandate. It's a little, not exactly obligatory, but the custom is for the chazan, the shliach uh, tzibur, uh, to take the Sefer Torah out of the Aron Kodesh. Uh, let me just make one quick linguistic point, which is important. The, the difference between chazan and shliach tzibur, and we're going to be using both of those terms, uh, back in the good old days, in the Middle Ages, Back in the good old days when all was right with the world, the uh, the, the only difference between chazan and shliach tzibur was that chazan was the term commonly used in Sfarad, in Spain, amongst the Sfaradim. 
for the leader of the congregation in prayer. And shliach tzibur uh, was the, the, the term used for the leader of the congregation in prayer in Ashkenaz territory. The words meant exactly the same thing, but uh, back in the Middle Ages, the division was between uh, Svaradim, who said Chazan, and Ashkenazim, who said Shliach Tzibur. And of course, at the, by the end of the Middle Ages, when there was already a mixing of Sephardic and Ashkenaz communities, then uh, both both groups, both the Sephardim and the Ashkenazim, began using uh, both terms. Uh, the Chazan takes a safer Torah from the Aron Kodesh, the Omer, and the, the Chazan, the Shliach Tzibur, says... Paul Nidre Vasare Dindana Dishtabana Dakra Yom Kippurim Shavara Yom Kippurim Z says the whole text of Kol Nidre, and we're going to be talking in greater detail about the text in a few minutes, says the whole text, Umiskaven and the Shliach Tzibu, the Chazan has Kavana, has in mind Lahatir Hanidarim Vaharamos Vashvuas has in mind to to uh, release all of the vows that the people had made. Maybe, someone in the community made a vow that they're now guilty of violating. Well, we have to release the vow. So that the person will escape any penalty. Well, the Rosh, one of the great Ba'alir Tosafot, one of the great Tosafists, one of the all-time great rabbis in Spain and in the Middle Ages, tells us that what Kol Nidre is all about is release of vows. Now, now, now this term, lahatir, uh, this term about releasing vows is a term which has to be understood very clearly. Um, uh, it says it says in the Torah Al Yahel Adam Dvaro let's get the, the important word typed on chat Yahel um, uh, one should not Yahel one's word if you make a vow I promise you give your word Lo Yahel you should not Yahel your words you should not Yahel, your vow. Uh, what was what, what this word? Yahel? The word Yahel is a very strange word. It sounds to grammarians like it has something to do with whole, uh, a weekday, chulin, non kodish stuff, the secular stuff. And, and therefore, and therefore, the, the word in the verse is usually understood. As lo yachel adam devaro, one should not desanctify one's words. One should not secularize one's words. One, uh, w your word should be holy. You should always keep your vows. You should not violate your vows. And the violation of the vow is called the secularization. Um, de, uh, uh, Treating your treating your words as not being holy, uh, the, 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 this is the way the 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 verse was understood for many years. But what Chazal say, uh, Chazal interpret the verse a little bit differently. Lo yachel adam devaro, you should not violate your vows. But Chazal, the great rabbis of the Gemara, add acherim miyachalim lo. Others, namely the members of the Bet Din, the rabbis of the rabbinic court, Meyachalim Lo can release you from your vow. Vows can be released. You can be released from a vow uh, uh, of a vow, and the, the way to get released is to approach a petition to ask a rabbinic court. Rabbinic court has to have at least three judges in it. And uh, the three judges can then release you from the vow. Now, the truth is, there's an entire tractate of the Gemara devoted to the question of exactly which vows can be released, which vows cannot be released. And uh, uh, you have to go to a competent, a competent Bedin 
consisting of three rabbis who have, of course, studied that tractate in the Gemara. They know which vows can be released and which vows cannot be released. And if it's a releasable vow, then the three rabbis will say, mutalach, 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 say three times. And now the vow is released. It's as though uh, there's no vow at all. Now, uh, linguistically speaking, um, uh, this word yachel uh, probably has nothing to do with chol or chulin, secular stuff, as opposed to holy things. Uh, linguistically speaking, uh, there's a, uh, a, uh, a, uh, a in, in South Arabian literature in, in in, in Semitic literature, which is very closely allied with the Northwest uh, dialects, including Hebrew, uh, the, the root yachel has a slightly different meaning. Uh, the word yachel in the South Arabic dialects means to untie, to untie a knot. Now, in Hebrew, in Hebrew, uh, the word pair, asur, mutar, that word pair in Hebrew, asur and mutar, here we have them typed on chat, asur, mutar, this word pair has a, a simple meaning of prohibited, permitted. Everyone knows that, asur, prohibited, mutar, permitted. But the truth be told, these meanings of the words, prohibited, permitted, these meanings are secondary meanings of the words. The primary meanings of these two words are asur, mutar, asur, chained up or tied, bound up, chained up, tied up, or mutar, unchained, unbound, untied. Um, uh, uh, when... Uh, when, when, when teaching Hebrew, one wants to uh, teach the uh, uh, the students the original meaning of the word and the secondary meaning of the word. One well, one can pose the following scenario to teach the students who are learning Hebrew. If someone wants to get onto the bus carrying a dog, the passenger with the dog might ask the driver. Are you allowed to take a dog onto the bus? To which the driver might respond, Asur Mutar, Mutar Asur. Ah, if the, the uh, dog is tied up, leashed, Mutar, it is permitted to have the dog on the bus. Mutar, if the dog is untied, unbound, unleashed, Asur, then it's prohibited. To have the dog on the bus. Well, 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 you see that if the word yahel in early Semitic languages meant untied, unchained, unburned, un, uh, un, un, uh, 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 untied, then of course the interpretation of Chazal, lo yahel adam devaro, one should not untie, one should not release one's own vow, achirim yachlim lo, but the bet din can do it for you. Bottom line, according to the Rosh, the whole purpose of Hataras Nidaram, the whole purpose of Kol Nidre is Hataras Nidaram, release of vows. And I just say very briefly that the category of vows which can be released are the vows which are entirely between you and God. If the vow is a private matter, between you and God, and does not in, does not uh, does not affect your relationship with other people, then the bet din can release you. On the other hand, a vow which involves your relationship with other people, I'm going to do such and such for someone. I'm going to uh, pay someone such and such or give someone a gift. If the vow involves other people, then releasing the vow is not so simple. Uh, what do we know up to this point? According to the Rosh, Kol Nidre 
is for the purpose of releasing those vows which can be released by a rabbinic court. Let's go one step further. Rav Amram Gon, one of the great Rashi Yeshiva in Babylonia, after the close of the Talmud, wrote as follows, and and, uh, let me just point out once again that I'm not going to bother mentioning the exact sources that I draw my texts from because you always have the precise source, uh, page number, chapter number, line number, and so forth uh, on the screen if you want to check out the original the original sources and see the correct spelling because I'm a, I'm not a very good typist. This is what Rav Amron, what, what, what Rav Amram Gon wrote in Babylonia. Call Nidre Vasoreva Haramish Shvuek Yuin Anafrasai has the whole text of of Kol Nidre. Bekulam Chazarda, we regret all of the vows. Banu Lefnei Avinu Shabashamayim, we come before God because we're talking about those vows which only into, which only affect the relationship between us and God. Uh, we want our neder to be released as though there is no neder at all. Uh, if it's a, if we proclaim some kind of prohibition, we want it released. If it's some kind of harem, we want it released. Uh, if it's a shvua, we want it released. Uh, uh, well, bottom line, according to Rav Amron, According to Rav Amram Gon, Kol Nidre is a bakasha, a request that all of our vows be released. And of course, when recited by the Chazan, the Chazan will then release us from all the vows. And the vows will be Batl Ha'isur Mi'ikara. Uh, the uh, vows will be released. Uh, Mi'ikara, the, the releasing of a vow is retroactive and therefore if one made a private uh, vow to god i'm not going to do such and such uh, and, and you did it if you can have the vow released the vow is released retroactively from the time you made the vow and therefore uh, you're not guilty of actually having violated the vow if it can be released retro if it can be released retroactively um, and that works with all kinds of vows and all kinds of neder and all kinds of shvua. Once again, according to uh, to Rav Amram, uh, Rav Amram, we're talking about Hataras Nidaram, and then the Chazan says, Nislach lechol adas b'nei Yisrael v'lagar hager b'savukiki lechol am b'shkaga. The Chazan pronounces the release of all vows for the people in the congregation. Now, now, now let, 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 let's think about this for a moment. And as I indicated before, the Gemara makes perfectly clear that release of vows requires a bet din, a rabbinic court. And a bet din, a rabbinic court, must have at least three rabbis sitting on it. Now, in fact, uh, for the Hataras Nidorum, which uh, unlike cases where there's a financial dispute between two people, if there's a financial dispute between two people, you need three qualified judges. But if it's only an issue of a vow between you and God, not involving any financial dispute with other people, not involving anyone else except you and your relationship with God, you still need a bet din, you still need a court of three judges, but not all three judges have to be fully qualified. Uh, If you have one judge who is fully qualified to decide whether or not your vow is releasable, if you have one fully qualified uh, diet, one fully qualified judge, he can take two ordinary Jews uh, to sit next to him to constitute a bet din, and uh, he'll, the, the one who really knows will make the decision about whether or not your vow is releasable, and that if, if so, if it is releasable, then the three will will together release your vow. But you need a bet din 
and you need three Jews to do it. And therefore, according to the sources we've seen up till now, uh, Kol Nidre cannot be done in private. Be doing it in private accomplishes absolutely nothing. You need at least four people to be involved, uh, one person releasing his or her vows, and three other people have to be participating in the event in order to make it work. You need at least three people to release the vow of one person. Without, without at least four people present, uh, Kol Nidre makes absolutely no sense. If you have four people together, four or more, then each combination of three can release the vows of the fourth person, and it will work if you have at least four people together. But, but uh, in private, in this case, in private is defined as less than four people. It simply does not work. Furthermore, if you think about it for a moment, you realize that um, uh, this whole this whole business of Hataras Nidaram, this whole business of releasing vows, has to do with any vows you made in the past. There's uh, no talk here. There's no reference here. There's, there's nothing here about vows you might make in the future. That's, uh, we'll worry about the future when we come to it. But the, the vows being released are vows that you made in the past. And therefore, according to the text which these rabbis have quoted, the text refers to vows in the past, vows I made since last Yom Kippur a year ago until this Yom Kippur now. The, the text refers to vows made in the past year, and those are the vows being released. And it has to be in public. So there are two conclusions so far. Number one, it has to be in public. Public defined is at least four people together. Number two, uh, the text has to be written in the past tense, recited in the past tense, referring to vows that you already made in the past. The text has nothing to do with uh, future vows which you've not made yet. That Those are two conclusions to be drawn from the text we've seen up to this point. Let's go one step further. The Hagot Maimoniot, usually I'm very careful, to specify the precise name of the authors of our texts, but in this case, the author is unknown. Uh, the Hagot Maimoniot was um, uh, 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 from Ashkenaz, and um, hist historians are quite are quite sure that the author of the Hagot Maimoniot was a disciple of Rabbi Meir Merottenberg um, in, the, in in thirteenth century Germany. The reason historians are quite sure of this is because uh, he quotes my rabbi quite a number of times, and every time he quotes the opinion of my rabbi, it turns out to be identical with a published opinion of Reb Meir Merottenberg. So uh, pretty sure, pretty sure that he was a disciple, but which of the disciples of Reb Meir Merottenberg it was is simply, simply, simply unknown. Uh, let me... Uh, uh, Further point out that the Hagot Maimonia that we're about to quote from is written in the form of a commentary on the Rambam. And uh, uh, the, the Rambam, the Mishnah Torah of the Rambam was first published uh, by, um, by uh, Svardik uh, publishers, Svardik printing presses. Uh, uh, this is a little bit of a complicated issue. Uh, unlike most svarim, unlike most books which have a first printed edition, um, the Mishnah Torah of the Rambam has three first editions: uh, one in Spain before the expulsion, just before the expulsion of the Jews from Spain; one in Italy and one in Turkey. Uh, three first editions, which were done independently of each other. Uh, uh, those those three first editions were published without commentaries. Uh, the first edition, which was published with commentaries, was published in Turkey, and uh, 
since it was published by Svardik Publishers, it was uh, published with only Svardik commentaries, just the opposite of the fate of the Shulchan Aruch. Uh, the first edition of the Shulchan Aruch, which was published with commentaries, Shulchan Aruch was originally published in 1520. Five plus or minus a little bit in in Venice, but without commentaries. The the, the first the first edition of the Shulchan Aruch with the commentaries was published by Ashkenazim, and uh, all the, all the commentaries are Ashkenazic. And to this very day, every standard edition of the Shulchan Aruch is published with Ashkenaz commentaries, and to this very day. Every standard edition of the every standard edition of the Rambam's Mishnah Torah is published with Svardic commentaries. The one exception to this rule is the Hagod Mamoniot that we have on the screen before us. The um, the Svardic publishers in Turkey, who published the first edition of the Mishnah Torah with commentaries, thought incorrectly that Hagod Mamoniot had a Sephardic sound to it. And since they did not know who the author was, they assumed that the author was Sephardi. Uh, shortly after the publishing of the first edition of the Rambam with the Hagaot Maimoniot, together with other Sephardic commentaries, shortly after it was published, it was quickly discovered that Hagaot Maimoniot is not Sephardic at all. Uh, when they came to print the second edition, uh, they had already created a market for the Hagot Mamoniot. Everyone, everyone was expecting it to appear in the second edition. But being in Ashkenazi, they would, would have preferred to eliminate him entirely from the printed editions of the Mishnah Torah, which they couldn't do because the market had already been created. Everyone was expecting it to appear in the second edition. So in the second edition, the uh, the, the Hagot Mamoniot does indeed appear, but severely abridged. If you want the full text of the uh, Hagot Mamoniot, you have to look, look in the first edition, and it's very hard to find copies, uh, only in rare book libraries. Um, uh, the, the text of the Hagot Mamoniot in all subsequent editions is highly abridged, until we come to the Shabtai Frankel edition, which was uh, published just around uh, uh, 30 years ago by Shabtai Frankel, an Ashkenazi, and he was the first to restore the full original text of the Hagat Mamoniot. In any event, I'm quoting here from the full text, not the uh, highly abridged text. If you, if you don't find it uh, in the um, Mishnah Torah on your shelf, you have to look either in the Shabtai Frankel edition, which restores the full uh, uh, first edition text, or if you have a rare book library, you can uh, you can look in the first edition and you'll see the full text there. This is what Hagod Memonio wrote: Kol nidre hinhig ra'avan shar kadmonim gedoli Ashkenaz lomar. All the great Ashkenaz rabbis uh, instruct us to recite the text as follows. Miyom Kippur Sha'avar, from last Yom Kippur, a year ago, Ad Yom Kippur Azeh, until this Yom Kippur now, uh, all of our vows should be released. Matir Bo Nidarim Al Shana Sha'avra. The text is written in the past because it refers to vows that you made in the past, has nothing to do with the future, uh, and therefore this Hataras Nidaram, referring to the release of vows from the past requires the presence of at least three uh, other Jews who are going to act as the Bedin to release you. And since people tend to uh, uh, treat their vows insincerely, since people uh, tend to treat their vows frivolously and violate them, Therefore, matirim kodem yom kippur. Therefore, we want to make sure all the vows are released before yom kippur, which is the day of mechila uslicha, the day when Akharish Baruch is going to forgive us. We want the vows released before 
the judgment of Yom Kippur so that we will not be carrying the burden of having violated those vows. The vows will be, will be released retroactively from the time we made them. Lefichach, therefore, Omer Shalosh Pa'amim Kedin Kol Hataras Nedarim, just like every Hataras Nedarim has to be recited three times if you have a personal vow that you wish to have released, you'll go to a Bet Din or find one uh, rabbi, one uh, qualified judge who'll take two ordinary Jews together with him to constitute a Bet Din. And if your vow is releasable, they'll say, Mutalach, 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 three times, they said three times in order to release you from the vow. That's why Kol Nidre has to be recited three times. So we know that it has to be a public event, at least four people. Uh, we know that it has to be formulated in the past tense because it's referring to vows you made in the past. And now we know that um, it has to be done three times because Hattaris and Dorum require release of vows requires uh, repetition three times. This is what all the old time rabbis have taught us. The custom is, the practice is for everyone to, present to recite the words of Kol Nidre together with the Chazan. It's not only the Chazan who says the words and you listen. If it's only the Chazan saying the words, you don't have three people releasing the vows. If it's a small group, four people. You need three, at least three people to recite the text in order to release the vow of the fourth person. Well, if it's four people, they're releasing each other's vows, but there always is always three against one in whatever combination of the four you make. But in a, in a larger congregation, we want everyone to be reciting the text so that in every case, there are at least three people releasing your specific vows. Oh, and, and, and the Chazan, the Shliach Tzibur, also needs his vows to be released. And therefore, if it's only the Chazan reciting the text, his own vows are surely not being released. Therefore, everyone should recite the vow. Everyone should recite Kol Nidre together. So everyone is participating in releasing everyone else's vows. Now, if you think about it for a moment, you realize that one important issue has fallen out of the discussion. Remember I said that at least one of the rabbis and the Bet Din has to be fully qualified. Uh, otherwise, Hattaris Nadarim simply doesn't work. Not all vows are releasable. And you need at least one qualified rabbi on the panel who will know whether or not your vow is releasable, and if so, mutalach, 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 the three will say together the release of vows, and you'll be and you'll be you'll be done. Um, the requirement of at least one fully qualified dayan has fallen out of the discussion, and what we have now is just uh, ordinary Jews. Uh, as educated as they may be, probably not qualified to be rabbinic judges, uh, performing the release of vows for everyone else. How on earth can this work? Well, of course, it cannot work uh, unless we're talking about releasable vows. Although uh, you might not know whether or not your specific vows are releasable or not, You've not yet presented your case to a bet din for a discussion. If, in fact, your vows are releasable, then call Nidre will be effective. But since we don't have a real Bezdin operating here, since we don't have a real rabbinic court operating here, uh, there's, there's no final decision about which of your vows are releasable or not. If they are releasable, the procedure works. If they're not releasable, you're still stuck with them and still guilty of having violated them. Call Nidre only works 
for those vows which are strictly between you and God and don't involve anyone else. Up to this point, that is the approach we've taken. Now, from this point on, I'm going to turn around and take a whole different approach, a very different understanding of what Kol Nidre is all about. Uh, other rabbis understood it very different. Well, let's see the other approach. Where is it? Here we are. Rabbeinu Tam. Uh, Rabbeinu Tam was a grandson of Rashi and one of the founders of the Beit Midrash of the Bali Atosafot. Rabbeinu Tam was a heavyweight. He was uh, extraordinarily influential. Let's see what he has to say. Everything, everything we've said up to this point does not, uh, is rejected by Rabbeinu Tam. Rabbeinu Tam doesn't think that anything we've said up to this point is correct. He has a totally different understanding of things. Uh, here comes here comes Rabbeinu Tam's approach. Hatarazo ain't a mo'elet. This idea that Kol Nidre releases from releases your vows just doesn't work. It's silly. You can't release your vows just by reciting some magical formula or in the, uh, or singing it Kol Nidre on. Uh, at the beginning of Yom Kippur, that just doesn't work. Why not? Because in order to release vows, you really need a competent, qualified bet din. If you don't have a qualified bet din, there's no such thing as releasing vows. You can't get the whole congregation together and everyone just releases everyone else's vows. It doesn't work. Only a fully qualified bet din, only a fully qualified rabbinic court can do the job of releasing vows. And most communities, most synagogues don't have a fully qualified rabbinic court among their membership, which is going to be reciting Hataris Nidorum, and therefore the whole thing, the whole Kol Nidre beginning to end, just doesn't work. It's useless. Ode, furthermore, Ein Hacham Matir et Aneda Belocharata. Furthermore, there are many requirements for releasing vows. It's not such a simple procedure. There's a ton of requirements. Among the requirements is you must regret having made the vow. If you did not regret, there are many steps required in order to release vows. Uh, one of the most important is regret. And uh, who says the people regretted making the vows? I mean, now they want out of the vows. I understand they violated their vows. They want them released. But it doesn't mean they regretted making the vow when they made it. Uh, uh, um, uh, most people, if they make a vow, are sincere and serious about it when they make the vow. Uh, they might later on regret having done it, but that's not good enough in order to release a vow you need regret at the time you're making the vow. And that simply doesn't happen very often. Kol Nidre, as, a, as, a, as an exercise in releasing vows, doesn't work. Oh, and furthermore, Kaimel and Rav Papa, furthermore, everyone paskins like, like Rav, Rav Papa, everyone embraces the opinion of Rav Papa in the Gemara, the Tzarek Lefaret Taneda, in order one of the steps, one of the requirements of releasing vows is you have to tell the Bet Din what the vow is. How on earth is the Bet Din going to be able to decide whether or not your vow is regrettable, is, is, is releasable, if they don't know what the vow is? Uh, you have to say specifically and clearly to the Bet Din what the vow is. And in Kol Nidre, no one is doing that. 
This is another reason why why Kol Nidre simply doesn't work. The ode, furthermore, Hachazan Omer Kol Nidre, Mihitir Nidro. Furthermore, if if uh, if the congregation does not recite the words together, if you don't have qualified judges reciting the text together with the Chazan, so who's going to release the vows of the, of the Chazan? The Tnan says in the Mishnah, Kol Nedarim Adam Mater Chutzman Didre Atzmo. I bet the, the rabbis on the rabbinic court, of course, cannot release their own Nedarim. Uh, you can't release your own Nadara. That's fairly simple and straightforward. Uh, after all, the decision about whether or not your vow is releasable, you're not qualified to make that because you are no gea uh, the, the decision affects you profoundly and therefore other people must be entrusted to make the decision. Well, for many, many reasons. Rabbeinu Tam uh, says, Kolidre doesn't work. Yeah, okay. No, Hatars uh, to Dorm, the people do before Rosh Hashanah, that's a different shiur. <laughs> we have to just discuss that in, in a different context. Haya Omer Rabbeinotam. Rabbeinotam said as follows Kolidre is not Hatars to but it is something else. Kol Nidre is important, but it has nothing to do with Hataras Nidarm. Min Hagzeh noheg al pi halacha shel Nidarm. The reason we say Kol Nidre is because of one very important halacha. It's none. We learn in the Mishnah. Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov Omer. The great rabbi in the Mishnah teaches us, Someone who wants to impose a vow upon his friend, requiring his friend to be a guest at a meal. I have a wedding and I am imposing upon you a vow that you will come to my wedding and eat at the wedding feast. Well, you should say, Kol neder shani atid lidor harehu bato. Everyone should say the following text once a year. You too should say the following text once a year. Any vow that I shall make in the future, I consider to be null and void. I am now proclaiming that any vow I will make at any future time shall be null and void, bottle and of no, of no consequence. If you make such a proclamation, if you proclaim now any vow that I make in the future, shall be null and void, bottle, and of no standing, if you proclaim that now, then indeed, any vow that you make in the future will be null and void and of no standing with the condition that you forget your proclamation. <laughs> what on earth does he mean? So it says like this. You remember, on the previous screen, we learned that Harata, regretting making a vow at the time you make it. No, I believe that there's not enough. Regretting making a vow at the time you make it is a valid basis for releasing the vow. Well, if I declare now, at this very moment, any future vow I make, I declare now that I regret doing it. I, I don't regret 
that I'm going to invite so and so to my wedding. I don't regret the invitation, but I I declare now that I regret making it in the form of a vow. I don't want to impose a vow upon my friend to come to the wedding to my wedding. I just want to invite him. I declare now that I regret any vows I'm going to make in the future. Um, I want to uh, to go on a, a on a diet and. Uh, I make a vow not to eat this, not to eat that. I declare now that any vow I make in the future about going on a diet, I regret making vow. I don't regret refraining from eating this or refraining from eating that, just like I don't regret inviting my friends to the uh, to, to my wedding. I just don't want the obligation to be in the form of a vow. Well, if I declare now, if I proclaim now that from now on, I regret the obligation of any vow that I make in the future, so the regret is already in place, assuming that I forget the proclamation when I make the actual vow. If I remember the proclamation, when I make the actual vow, that means even though I proclaimed in the past that I regret making vows, I'm now canceling that proclamation and I now intend to make a vow. Uh -huh. uh, so the declaration, the proclamation that you regret future vows works as long as you have forgotten that proclamation, as long as you've forgotten that declaration. Uh, for this reason, I personally do not wish to use a written text for proclaiming my regret, my future regret for making any vows. If I have a written text, it's sort of hard to say that I've forgotten the text because it's written down somewhere. I can always look it up. I prefer, personally, to uh, compose a text uh, ad lib just to make up a, a random text and when surely, surely, uh, uh, within a few minutes, I will forget the exact text that I used, but the, the meaning will still be in effect. Uh, any uh, vow that I'm going to make in the future, I consider to be null and void, bottle and mavotal. Well, uh, as soon as I've forgotten the, the, the exact wording of this text, then it's effective regarding any future vow. Bottom line, according to Rabbeinu Tam, the whole purpose of Kol Nidre has nothing to do with releasing you from vows that you made in the past. Rather, it's intended to prevent the effectiveness of any vows you might make in the future. Kol Nidre is intended to prevent any vows you make in the future from being valid. It's an it's a it's a it's a, an advanced invalidation of any future vows. The Alpi Halachazo, according to this, Nahagulo Kol Bekol Nidre, Miyom Kippur, the Al Tanayim Shoshana Haba, and therefore Kol Nidre must be formulated in the future. All vows which I will make from this Yom Kippur until next Yom Kippur. The, the the text has to be formulated in the future. Yes, you just have to forget the exact text, and then and then the proclamation remains in effect. Well, according to Rabbeinu Tam, Kol Nidre is a proclamation, a declaration that I regret making any any vows in the future. Any vows I make in the future, let it be known. I want to invite my friends to the way to my wedding. I, I want to refrain from eating this and, or that, but I don't want the I don't want it to be with the obligation of a vow. Uh, uh, that, that that's the way it works, according to um, that's the way it works, according to Rabbeinu Tam. According to Rabbeinu Tam, therefore, Kol Nidre must be formulated in the future, not in the past. All the previous screens we've seen talk about all the vows I've made from last year until now. Rabbeinu Tam says, no, 
the text must be written and formulated in the future. Any vows that I make from now until next year. Uh, uh, this is very different than the previous screens, uh, uh, which were talking about Hattaras Nidorum in the past, and therefore required the presence of at least three other people, and uh, all the requirements we've seen up to all those requirements fall away, according to Rabbeinu Tam. According to Rabbeinu Tam, the proclamation can be made in private. It's only between you and God, after all. Uh, you, you don't need a bet din to make a proclamation to God. Uh, can, can, can be done in private. Uh, according to, to Rabbeinu Tam, there's no particular reason for the for the congregation to recite everything together with the chazan unless they wish to. Um, uh, the chazan himself is not releasing his past vows, in which case the people would have to recite the text along with him. Uh, just a proclamation about the future, which could equally be done in private. Since it's so important, we do it all together as a congregation just before Yom Kippur starts. But uh, you could do it in private if you wish. No problem at all. Let's go one step further. Now that we see this big machlokas, this big disagreement, uh, the disagreement from uh, polar opposites, uh, going to the uh, the first group of poskim we saw, we're talking about release of vows in the past and all that follows, all that flows out of that. According to Rabbeinu Tam, we're talking about blocking future vows and all the conclusions that flow from that. Uh, which of these approaches should we embrace? W which is the correct one? Which is the definitive one? Uh, which approach is the approach embraced by subsequent poskim? What is the accepted opinion? Well, let's see the Radbaz. Radbaz was the great uh, rabbi of Egypt uh, right at the end of the Middle Ages, beginning uh, of modern times, and he was asked the following question. Sheila. Call Nidre, Shuragil Mulamabaliya Lela Kippurim, when we recite Call Nidre. Lafishiyesh Mishakatavu Dambalashnava, some rabbis say it should be formulated in the past tense, and we understand why. Yesh Mishakatavu Lashnatid, some rabbis say it should be formulated in the future tense, and we understand why. I mean the spoch, which opinion should we follow? That's the question that the Radbaz was asked. Chuva. Answer. It's a big controversy out there. Rabbis have been arguing about this since the days of the Gaonim, when the text was first introduced. Some rabbis say to formulate it in the past tense, and we saw those sources. Some rabbis formulate it in the future, and we saw those sources. Some people say, the whole thing is just useless. Skip the whole thing. Just delete uh, Kol Nidre from uh, Yom Kippur. After all, people incorrectly think that Kol Nidre can somehow release them from all of their vows. And therefore, people no longer will treat vows frivolous. People will no longer treat vows seriously. They'll be very frivolous about vows if they incorrectly think that Kol Nidre is somehow releasing them from vows which have to do with interpersonal relationships as well. Uh, better to skip the whole thing and not create the false impression in people's minds that somehow they are released from their obligations of an interpersonal nature. To get, having to do with their fellow man. Uh, and indeed, this is the practice of the Musta'aruim in Egypt. Uh, the, 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 the term Svaradi is today used more or less interchangeably with Eidot Mizrach, all of the Oriental communities, but historically it's not true at all. Uh, historically, Svaradim came from Spain. 
And after the after the uh, expulsion of the Jews from Spain, the Sfaradim, the Spanish Jews, made their way to various communities in North Africa, various communities in the uh, Levantine area, various communities in Europe, Ham, Hamburg, Amsterdam, London. The Sephardic, the Spanish Jews, uh, were transplanted into many communities. Among them, Egypt. Uh, Egypt saw an influx of uh, Sephardic Jews after the expulsion of the Jews from Spain. That's quite clear. But uh, this always led, this always led to two separate communities living side by side in Egypt, in Damascus, uh, in Amsterdam, in London, in all of the places where the Sephardic Jews were transplanted after the expulsion in Rhodos, in Smyrna. We now have two communities, two Jewish communities living side by side, the original indigenous Jewish communities, which had been there for centuries before the expulsion of the Jews from Spain, and the newcomers, uh, the transplanted Sephardim, who came from Spain. And the, these two communities continue to live side by side in North Africa, in Levantine areas, in Europe, and so forth and so on. And uh, in order to uh, clarify which community we are talking about, in North Africa, the original indigenous Jewish communities, which had been there since uh, uh, since um, Hellenistic time, at least since Hellenistic times, the uh, they were called the Mustarim, the Arabic-speaking Jews, as opposed to the uh, transplanted Jews from uh, Spain who were not Arabic-speaking. They spoke Ladino. Um, the, the Jews in in uh, in Spain stopped speaking Arabic after the Reconquista. After the Christian reconquest of Spain, uh, 13th century, the Jews stopped speaking Arabic and started speaking Spanish, uh, 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 Ladino. And therefore, we, after the expulsion, we have the Ladino-speaking communities in Turkey, in Africa, and so forth, and the Arabic-speaking communities in North Africa, which were the original indigenous Jewish communities. In any event, the the Mustarim and I just point out in passing in modern Israeli Hebrew, this word has a very different meaning. In modern Israeli Hebrew, in the Israeli army in Sahal, in in the in the Israeli army, this word is used for Israeli soldiers who uh, speak Arabic and infiltrate uh, Arab communities and live amongst the Arabs. Uh, uh, for purposes of um, espionage, uh, to report back to their um, uh, to their uh, to the Israeli army what they learned. So uh, Mustarav in 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 Israel, modern Israeli Hebrew means a Jewish soldier who is uh, uh, engaging in esp 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 espionage in Arab speaking communities. So, in any event, the original. Jew, the original Jewish community in Mitzrayim, Enom Rimoto, don't say Kol Nidri at all. Well, it's simply not, not part of the liturgy amongst the traditional communities in North Africa. Kala Rambam Zol Lo Kiro. Rambam doesn't have Kol Nidre at all. It's something which came from Spain and the Spanish communities recite it. I personally, the Radbaz writes, I say both past tense and future tense. I say all the vows from last Yom Kippur until now and any vow I might make from now until next Yom Kippur. I combine both past and present. I say both in order to cover both opinions. That's the approach of the Radbaz. We're going to pause at this point. Next week, we're going to see what the more contemporary, more recent rabbis have to say about this, and then we'll be able to come to some bottom-line conclusions about what we should actually do. Until then, 
I wish you a, a good week and a safe week and look forward to seeing you all again next week. Until then, uh, Shabbat Shalom and Chodesh Tov for those who are still in the time zones where it's Rosh Chodesh. Thank you very much, Rabbi. You're welcome. Thank you, Rabbi. This is really a Rabbi. lot of information. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you, Rabbi. Well, no. Shabbat Shalom almost now. Shabbat Shalom, Chodesh Tov. Chodesh Tov. You're welcome.